My name is Vivek Jha. I am an adult nephrologist from New Delhi in India. I have done clinical nephrology for more than 35 years. In addition to uh, being a clinician, I am a long-standing researcher with interest in clinical trials of glomerular diseases and have been involved in many IgA nephropathy clinical trials. I also hold a position of uh, the chair of Global Kidney Health at Imperial College London. In my current position as the executive director of the George Institute for Global Health, I have a strong interest in health system implementation research, which means that we are looking to take the evidence that has been shown to be potentially beneficial to the people who can benefit from it. And this requires us to work with multiple stakeholders, take a multidisciplinary approach, and do the kind of work, including implementation research, uh, that helps with uh, that goal. So, we have known for a long time that IgA nephropathy is an immune complex mediated disease. The diagnosis of IgA nephropathy is based on immunofluorescence. And in immunofluorescence, we see deposits of immunoglobulin A and immunoglobulin G in varying amounts in the glomerulite. But over the last few years, we have been able to understand a lot more into how those immune complexes reach there and what do they do to the glomeruli by our understanding of uh, IgA nephropathy. So we now know that IgA nephropathy is a four hit process in which the first and perhaps the most important hit is the development and release of galactose deficient IgA1 molecules from the intestinal mucosae. This then leads to development of autoantibodies against these IgA1 molecules, which are galactose deficient, and often they are called GDIGA because they're galactose deficient. These immune complexes are then formed, which is the third hit by combination of the autoantibodies along with the GDIGA molecules. And then in the end, these immune complexes get deposited into the mesangium where they lead to inflammation, they lead to disruption of the glomerular filtration barrier, leakage of blood and leakage of protein in the urine, and subsequently progressive kidney damage. It's really important that we understand uh, these sequential pathways in the development of IgA nephropathy, because this gives us the opportunity to intervene at each of the steps in the, in the progress of IgA nephropathy. And that's why this understanding is really important and all the stakeholders, those who decide on the management of IgA nephropathy need to understand this because we can potentially use not just one drug but a combination of drugs which, uh, which uh, block multiple steps in the pathway and thereby eventually prevent development of uh, glomerular fibrosis and progressive kidney disease because that is our goal. The goal of treatment is eventually not only to reduce proteinuria or reduce hematuria, but to prevent the worsening of kidney function, which is the major problem with IgA nephropathy. We now know from data from large cohort studies that a large proportion of people with IgA nephropathy, both adults and children, will eventually progress to develop kidney failure during their lifetimes. For the longest time, we didn't have any specific therapies for managing people with IgA nephropathy. The approach that we would take as nephrologists was to ensure that people who developed IgA nephropathy are appropriately counseled regarding modifying their lifestyle, controlling their blood pressure, optimizing their weight, stopping smoking, etc. And the only other drug we had at our disposal was uh, drugs that block renin angiotensin system, ACE inhibitors, angiotensin receptor blockers, etc. So we ensured that the dosing of these agents was optimized in such a way as to ensure maximal reduction in proteinuria with these agents. Other than that, we didn't have anything. So when Kedigo published its guidelines for treatment of glomerular disease in 2012, we at that time encouraged that people with progressive risk of developing progressive IgA and nephropathy should be en enrolled into clinical trials. Now, I'm really glad to say that uh, over the course of the last 10 years, a large number of new molecules have been developed uh, 
with better understanding of the pathogenesis of the IgA nephropathy, and those molecules have entered clinical trials. Patients have been enrolled in clinical trials. So we have a number of drugs which are approved by the US FDA and regulatory agencies in other countries, and they are available now for uh, patients to use. Admittedly, not all countries, not all healthcare systems, their costs are still an issue in some healthcare system, etc. So now that we understand the pathogenesis of IgA nephropathy so much better, of the various agents that are currently in clinical trials, we can classify them into a few specific groups and make sure that all our patients receive therapies that address different parts of the pathway through these uh, uh, you know, classes of agents. So here, the first thing that we want to do is to hit at the uh, hit one, which is uh, the development of uh, aberrantly glycosylated, galactosylated IgA1 molecule. So what can we do to reduce the production of these uh, GD IgA1 molecules? And there we have an FDA-approved therapy, Neficon, which is targeted re release formulation of butoisonide uh, it works on the mucosal immune system. It's a kind of steroid, but it works on mucosal immune system to reduce the formation of GDIG1. It has been shown in clinical trials that it actually does that. It reduces proteinuria and it slows down the progression of kidney disease. So that is number one. Then second, we want to ensure that we go ahead and uh, target the B cells which will then develop B cells, then going on to transition to plasma cells. So these are drugs that are potentially uh, going to target B cells, B cell depleting agents and B cell modulating agents. So in B cell depleting agents, the one that we are most familiar with as nephrologists is rituximab. But rituximab unfortunately doesn't work in IgA nephropathy. It has been tried in clinical trials. The most likely reason is that rituximab doesn't act on B cells that have homed into uh, tissue niches. Uh, it acts only on circulating B cells, uh, which really are very small in number here in IgA nephropathy. But on the other hand, we have another antibody which targets CD38. And, and these antibodies which target CD38 are showing promise in clinical trials. So that may be the second approach uh, to target B cells. Now, Coming to the other drugs that modulate B cells, and those drugs primarily target the, the inflammatory markers or the cytokines, BAF and April. Those are the two key molecules which activate B cell, lead to class switch of B cells to uh, IgA1 producing B cells. And so BAF and April modulating drugs, some drugs uh, in, uh, inhibit only BAF, other drugs inhibit April, and some drugs inhibit both BAF and April. And all of these uh, uh, drugs that belong to these different classes are in clinical trial. In fact, one of them has also uh, uh, received uh, breakthrough designation from the FDA. Then we l look at drugs that can inhibit glomerular inflammation, and there the complement pathway becomes very important because there is ample evidence that complement is activated in IgA nephropathy, especially through the lectin pathway and the alternate pathway. And then there are now drugs that are, that are available to act on various factors that are uh, you know, part of the lectin pathway as well as alternate pathway. And we have these drugs in clinical trials and hopefully some of them will show benefit. And then the last group where we have to really pay attention to is then use drugs that can potentially block the progressive kidney damage that takes place through progressive inflammation in the glomeruli. And there we have the classical drugs like ACE inhibitors and subsequent addition of SGL2 inhibitors and much more recently uh, endothelin receptor antagonists. KDGO is a global organization and the guidelines developed by KDGO will potentially be used by everywhere all around the world and they're greatly anticipated by everyone. So we are keen to address the issue of implementation. How do we implement this new knowledge to ensure that people who can potentially benefit from this have access to therapies? That is going to take time, of course, we understand that. 
But during that time, it doesn't mean that there is nothing that can be offered to these people with hygiene nephropathy. Going back to the foundational uh, steps that we need to take, such as ensuring optimization of uh, you know, lab, lifestyle measures like blood pressure control, weight control, uh, cessation of smoking, irregular exercise, etc. Uh, systemic corticosteroids are also their place still, uh, but systemic corticosteroids should be used judiciously. And we need to take a number of factors into account before making the decision how to use systemic corticosteroids. For example, there may be a greater need to uh, ensure that a young person with uh, IgA nephropathy who has a long light ahead of uh, them would be a candidate for systemic corticosteroids. Whereas uh, another elderly individual with similar level of kidney function, similar level of proteinuria, may not necessarily benefit from corticosteroids and would be likely to be at risk of development of side effects. And there we might want to hold on to corticosteroids unless there are further reasons to use it, such as deterioration in kidney function. How do we best use these therapies? An interesting question, which hasn't been answered very well as yet. What is clear is that we need to simultaneously follow at least three approaches. The first approach is to ensure a reduction in GD, in production of GD IgA1, which is really the key driver of the disease. The second pathway which we need to address is uh, ensuring that uh, the GD IgA1 immunoglobulin complexes don't lead to inflammation in the glomerular mesangium. And the third is that we need to we need to have on board drugs that can interfere with the final common pathway of progressive glomerular damage as a result of this inflammation. So all these three classes of agents need to be used in all patients. Our goal is based on current understanding that as soon as the patient is diagnosed with IgA nephropathy and we determine that they are at risk of progression, we bring on board drugs that can slow down the basic common pathway of initiation of the disease and then combine them with uh, drugs that can uh, uh, that can slow down the final consequence of progressive glomerular damage that is absolutely clear what is going to be interesting for us to uh, to figure out uh, given the large number of molecules that are currently in clinical trials for uh, for the uh, for the HIT2 and HIT3 is to which of them is likely to be, to be the best for a given individual. And there we don't yet know the answer. There are a number of sub-studies that are currently being planned, which will require us to collect biomarkers, which will require us to look at kidney biopsies to find uh, predictive, uh, uh, predictive factors which can tell us whether we should go in one direction or the other. The story of last 12 years has been very exciting so far as IgA nephropathy is concerned. In the sense that not only do we better understand the disease mechanism, the pathogenesis, how the disease develops, but we are able to work with the innovators and pharmaceutical companies who have developed molecules that can potentially act on multiple pathways uh, in, in the development of disease. Clinical trials have been exciting. These clinical trials have all uh, been very positive. That fills the entire community with, uh, with optimism. But we have to recognize that the world is a very uneven place, unequal place. There are large parts of the world uh, where these resources are not easily available. And despite the fact that these therapies will potentially be shown to be beneficial, it will take a long time before these therapies become available in those countries. Many regulatory agencies in different countries now ask the pharmaceutical companies who want to undertake these trials to ensure the availability of the drugs in the market where these trials are being conducted. Pharma companies also appreciate this. And we have to learn lessons from other specialties in particular oncology and cardiology, where there is a long history of uh, these uh, new drug trials and uh, development of specific pathways that allow patients to access these drugs. So we are very hopeful. The great thing is that uh, organizations such as Kedigo bring this evidence together uh, and generate evidence-based guidelines. This evidence-based guideline can be used then by local stakeholders to advocate with their policymakers to 
to ensure that yes, these therapies are beneficial and should be made available. Many countries are now developing specific programs. And once again, I give example of my own country, which recently developed a rare disease policy under which patients uh, who have diseases which are in the list of the designated rare diseases will be able to receive even expensive therapies. So there is hope in, in the future and we have to continue to make sure uh, that the hope translates into action.